Okay, so let's move on then to the next um, set of notes. So these, excuse me, sorry. These were posted on the course website uh, yesterday morning, so you should have them by now and have them printed off. And this section deals with particle size characterization. So up to now in the course, we've only dealt with particles and assumed that they're circular shaped. We like circular shaped particles. You'll see this all over engineering. Who's taking 4K reactor design? Yeah, you guys are dealing with circular catalyst pellets, right? You'll never go look at a catalyst pellet that's shaped this way. Why not? It's too difficult, right? Mass transfer. We look through and consider everything as spherical when we're dealing with particles. Reactor design, particles are considered circular. So we know that this is not the reality, right? We, we're not trying to pretend that all particles are circular, but we like to work with circular particles because no matter which angle you look at this particle, it looks the same. So whether this particle is settling in a vertical direction or whether it's being thrown around horizontally in a centrifuge, the projection of that particle from every possible angle is circular. And so it's easy to deal with. But can we take our non-circular particles and approximate them as circular particles? And how can, we, how can we do that? And that's what we're going to consider in this section. And I'm only going to focus on shape and size and focus on how we can characterize that property of a particle. So as I said, most particles we'll deal with are non-circular, broken glass, sand, rock, Every industry that deals with solids will encounter this problem. Okay, so let's think about that for a second. Which industries deal with solids? Mining. Mining. Okay. Other industries that deal with solids. Some of you are going to work in careers with solid particles. None of you are going to work exclusively in fluids. So. What are we going to be, which areas are we going to be working in? Yeah. Steel. So steel pellets, for example, might be considered here. Yes. Pharmaceutical. Yeah. Metal packaging. Yeah, yeah. So I, like, what I'm getting at is like small particle sizes. So not, we're not talking big slabs of material, um, but smaller particle sizes. But, but in the steel and um, metals industry, you'll always find particles. Well, that's, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Pulp and paper. So just the, right at the, at the, like the, when you've broken, I'm uh, forgetting the word now, when you've broken down the tree into those strands of, Material, yeah, so pulp and paper. Anything else? Yes. Uh, food, industry. food industry, okay. A specific type of food? Sugar that we looked at earlier, yes. Flour, sugar, any of the ingredients Oats, cereals, grains, anyone who goes and works for Quaker Oats in PepsiCo, in Peterborough, you'll be dealing with lots of oats, grains, cereals. Okay, these particles show up everywhere. Pharmaceutical, it's, this is really important because in a pharmaceutical company, they're blending several powders together. These powders have different particle sizes and it's kind of interesting, if you blend particles of different sizes together, they mix. And if you keep blending, they actually start to unmix. Okay, it's really important that you want to give the tablet to someone that's well mixed and not just the active ingredient and cause damage to them. Right? So particle size distribution is 
is incredibly heavily used in pharmaceutical industry. So much so in, in many of these industries, not just pharma, but particularly it's there, where they go and they measure, have devices, and we'll look at this later on, that can look at these uh, particles in real time inside a pipe. So there's a pipe with the fluid flowing in the vertical direction, and they've added in this device that can read and automatically determine the particle size distribution. Remember that word, I'm gonna come back to it in a minute. They can determine that particle size distribution in real time flowing in that pipe. Okay, so any solids, whether those solids are suspended in liquid or in vapor, gas phase, they can determine that. So particle size distributions occur everywhere and I was kind of surprised when I first uh, got to teach this course that this, is, this topic is never covered in undergrad. So I figured, well, this is not kind of related to separations, but we're going to use it in the next few weeks. So I might as well get, get us a clear understanding of what's going on here. So let's um, take a look now at irregularly shaped particles. And one way we can quantify an irregularly shaped particle, so like a cube or a rectangle or a broken, unusually shaped piece of object, is to try and find how close that particle approximates a sphere. And one way we do that is by calculating sphericity. So there's the sphericity definition. It's the surface area of a sphere that has the same volume as that particle divided by the surface area of the irregularly shaped particle. So use that definition over there and prove to yourself, it's gonna take you a few minutes because this equation doesn't immediately work easily. So knock your head against this equation and work with someone next to you or on your own if you feel that way inclined to prove that the sphericity of a cube is 0 0.806. Go for it. This is not something you can do on, in your head, for sure. What information do you need? Is there anything you don't know that you need to know? It's C. Yeah. Everyone got the formulas for spheres that you, do you remember them? Look them up. 
Anyone got an answer yet? Yeah? Okay. So fairly straightforward once you've figured out what that numerator term is. The denominator term is easy. It's the surface area of the particle, which if you're dealing with a cube is, what's our denominator over there? 6C squared. The numerator is the harder part surface area of the sphere with the same volume as the particle. So if we take a cube, the volume of the particle, that last phrase over there is the, the same volume as the particle. So cube has volume C cubed. But what is the surface area of a sphere that has that same volume? Well, the volume of a sphere then is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So you can find the radius of that cube in terms of the, the size of the particle. So r is equal to 3 over 4 pi. You take the third root of that times c. It's outside the bracket. Okay. The numerator says, well, what's the surface area of the sphere? Well, let's just rearrange this. We call this r is equal to k star times c. All the stuff there in k star is constant. We can easily calculate it. But let's just wrap it up into a, a new constant over there. The surface area of the sphere is 4 pi r squared. Right, so that's my numerator then. So maybe let's just be explicit here. This is the area of the sphere. And if we sub that in 4 pi r squared, r squared is then k times c squared. You get a bit of cancellation there. The C's cross out, and you can calculate 0.806. Okay. So you can do this with any shape particle. As long as you can find its surface area of that particle, and you can find the equivalent sphere's area, then you can compute the sphericity. So what is the sphericity of a sphere itself? It's 1, OK? So surface area of a sphere with the same volume as the sphere. Is, so you're going to land up with a 1 over there. So we can make particle, or we can consider our particles to be more sphere-like or less sphere-like on this scale from 0 to 1. That's one way we can characterize our solids. Another way we can look at our solids is recognize that the solid has an irregular shape and find the diameter of the sphere that has the same something as the irregularly shaped particle. So what do we mean by that? Well, let's take a look at a few options. What is the diameter of a sphere that has the same surface area of the irregularly shaped particle? So you find the surface area of that irregularly shaped particle, set that equal to the equation for the surface area of a sphere, and solve for the sphere's diameter. We will use that, the surface area of a sphere, Oh, sorry, the equivalent surface area of a sphere in calculations where it's the surface area of the particle that matters. So we've got an irregularly shaped particle. Can we approximate that irregularly shaped particle with a sphere that has the same surface area? And that makes sense when we're dealing with things such as if we're taking this irregularly shaped particle, calculate the surface area of it. But what we're really concerned with is, for example, mass transfer in or out of that particle. That obviously has to pass through the surface area of that irregularly shaped particle. And so we can convert these irregularly shaped particles to an equivalent sphere that has the same surface area for mass transfer purposes. If we were dealing with sedimentation, you might want to find the equivalent sphere that has the area in the projected direction of travel so that you can calculate the drag. So now we're not concerned about the surface area of the actual irregularly shaped particle, we're concerned with that projected surface area when that particle is falling down and find the equivalent spherical diameter. <coughs> There's another one that we're going to focus on today, the equivalent <coughs> sphere that will fit through the same size square aperture. So what do I mean by that is, I'll pass this around, but here's a, a sieve, the sieve has square Holes. These holes are called apertures. It's just another name for it. 
So what is the equivalent size of a sphere that will fit through that same square aperture or hole? Okay, so take a look at this and pass it around. There's two of them. That one is robust. You can, probably won't be able to break it. This one is very fine. People in materials engineering will not like me if I return this one damaged. So please be careful with this one. Take a look at the side of the, the sieve as well. There's some markings on the side that we're going to consider. Okay, so various metrics. Here's some other ways we can consider irregularly shaped solids. So consider your body. You're an irregularly shaped solid. What is the, what is the circumference around your waist? Might be one way to quantify yourself. Okay, so I'm 32 inch waist. What is that circumference is good for sizing life jackets or for clothing? That would be the number that's of interest of my irregularly shaped body for the purpose of sizing clothing or a life jacket. But if I was considering the diameter of a sphere that has the same surface area as my body, now I've, I've taken the surface area of my body and converted myself to a sphere that has that same surface area, that would be good if I was trying to calculate heat losses through my skin, right? or evaporative losses due to uh, perspiration. The length of your longest cord. Um, this is probably a word that may not be too familiar. So if you take an irregularly shaped particle like that, the length of the longest cord is the longest possible, possible line that you can connect. So it might be that line. Okay. I could also draw a line from this corner to that corner, a straight line, but the blue line is shorter than the white line. So find the longest possible line from one end of the solid internally to the other end, and that's the cord. Okay, so if I was buying a sleeping bag, uh, that would be a number that I would use to, for this irregularly shaped sphere, uh, irregularly shaped solid. Okay. So various ways of, of looking at solids. In the pulp and paper industry, that example that was mentioned there by Brandon, so you're dealing with solids that are sort of like needle-shaped or irregularly thin-shaped lines, right? So there the length of those, that longest cord, is, is of interest. Okay, now one way we can characterize solids, though, there's, there's many ways we can do this. I, I've given you a few in the prior slides, but one way we're going to look at is particle size. And there's no single particle size, one particle size that for the solids. Solids will always have a distribution of particle sizes. So by the end of this section, what you're going to start to realize is everything we've taught you in engineering is when we've dealt with solids and said the diameter is such and such and given you a fixed number is never true there's always a distribution of diameters. Right? Even if you take the sugar crystals that you have at home, open a little bag and they look the same shape and size, but they're not. There's a distribution of sizes there. It's just that that distribution is very narrow. So you've all taken probability theory and distributions, so it's got a very narrow distribution. If you take a bunch of sand or soil just in your hands, that's got a very broad distribution. There's smaller particles, larger particles. So we're going to look at this concept of distributions. And once you leave the university, or you may even have experienced this in a co-op term, you're going to hear terms and phrases as follows. Let's say you're dealing in the mining industry. After crushing your ore, the feed can be ground in several stages, and you go from five to six centimeters that comes out of the ground from the mine, down to a powder form, and someone might say to you, 70 to 90% passes a 200 mesh sieve. What do they mean by that phrase? Someone in the pharmaceutical industry says, we need that powder to be 90% passing a 425 mesh sieve. What does that expression mean? Okay. So when, when we're looking at that, we're going, I'll come back to what that sieve size means. And those of you passing the sieves around, you'll see that, that marking printed on the side. But when we're looking at particle sizes, we typically work in microns. So let's just quickly 
um, get a, a feel for what a large size and a small size is. So detergents, powdered chemicals, powdered sugars. Um, we don't use powdered detergent so much anymore. It's mostly liquid detergent. But if you're looking at powdered sugar, flour, you're in the order of 100 microns. 100 and at the very large end, 1,000 microns. Fertilizers, again, granular fertilizer, not so prevalent anymore, but in the order of 10,000 microns. If you opened a laser printer cartridge, that black cartridge, and you banged it on the ground and opened it up and spread the black powder around, that powder is in the order of 10 microns, between 1 and 10 microns. Other pigments and dyes in the order of, of 1 micron. Organic pigments, um, and we're now dealing with very, very small metal catalysts, very, very small particle size. So we get a high surface area per unit volume. Okay? So we'll come back to that idea of surface area per unit volume in a later class, but just to give you a scale on which to reference things against. So there's actually a photo of this sieve that's being passed around right now. If you haven't got a chance to look at it yet, on the side, you'll notice those markings and you'll see that it's what's the Canadian sieve standard series and there's other standards. But in this Canadian standard, um, this is a number 10 sieve. And the number 10 sieve there has openings of two millimeters and there's the opening size in inches. So a number 10 sieve, that's really all you have to remember, has openings of two millimeters. What that refers to is the opening of the square on that aperture size being passed around. It is, again, just to make sure we're, we're dealing with the same size here, if you're looking at a, at a square, that opening refers to this dimension. It does not refer to the diagonal. Okay, it refers to the horizontal or vertical distance so a number 10 mesh screen has two millimeter openings and the 10 is used because it says there are 10 openings per linear inch. If you, any one inch that you consider in a horizontal direction, you will count 10 openings. So that very fine mesh that's being passed around <coughs> has got lots of openings per linear inch. It's going to have a higher mesh number. So let's take a look at that. So higher mesh numbers, the opening size is smaller. So maybe let's take a concrete example. A 200 mesh has openings that are 75 microns. Because there's 200 openings per linear inch, each opening is 75 microns. When we're down to a number 10 mesh, as I said, each opening was 2 millimeters, or another way of stating that is 2,000 microns. And that scale does take into account the, the thickness of the wire. Now, what is shown up here is what we call a standard sieve series. These, this progression follows in a very specific mathematical order. Each subsequent sieve has a ratio with the previous one of that amount over there. And what companies will do is they will buy a sequence of these sieves, stack them on top of each other, they're stackable, and at the bottom you have a pan. So every sieve is, of course you put your larger sieve on the top and then each one subsequently smaller, and at the bottom you have a closed pan to collect the last remaining solids that pass through the sieve just above it. And you put that on a shaker and you load your sample at the top and just shake that for five minutes. So those solids placed in the top will then settle down, pass through the sieves until they get to a point where they cannot pass through anymore. Anyone seen one of these devices in the lab here on campus or at a co-op term? No? No one's seen one of them before? Yeah? Okay, a few people. So this, I, any company that's dealing with solids will have one of these. I guarantee that. Um, and what's shown here is dry sieving. OK, 
Consider the case of taking a sample from, say, a mining industry or the oil sands, where you're dealing with solids that are sticky. There's some moisture on that solid, and the particles are sticking together. How are you going to get an accurate characterization so that the particles of the correct size land up on the correct sieve without the particles sticking together? Anything you can do there? Do that? Okay. So in those cases, what companies will do is they will have a water jet passing through there as well. Or very, not a jet, because that sounds too aggressive. It's, it's a very mild amount of water to try and separate the particles and encourage them to separate. And what that water will do is, is cause the separation and the water is taken out at the bottom. But now you've got wet solids. And so then what the company has to do is take each one of these trays and put them in an oven to dry the solids. So that's why these trays are metal. Because very often the solids are, are wet and we need to do a drying step afterwards. What we'll do then is after drying those solids, we will weigh each tray. So you weigh the tray empty, you weigh the tray after you've finished and dried the solids. And essentially what you're going to get from this is a table of numbers. So let me just um, jump ahead through this example over here. So here's my mesh size that I can read off the particular metal screen. I can see the aperture size that's also given to me. And then this third column is what the company or the laboratory technician measures. She or he will measure the mass that has been retained on that screen. Okay. And what you can see here, just visually, and you've done this probably in your stats course, is you can create a, <coughs> a sort of a stem and leaf plot from that from those numbers. So you can visualize, even if you didn't create it, you can visualize there's going to be a distribution that's sort of lying on its side over there, and that distribution looks something like that. And you can just see that numerically from the numbers being built up there. Okay. Now, that number that you see here in the middle, the 235, corresponds to an aperture size of about 600 microns. That's roughly the number that companies will report as the particle size. So this sample of material was put through the sieve, 491 grams. 235 of those 491 grams was retained on the sieve that had an opening of 600 microns. So sometimes people will just simply say very loosely, this sample has a particle size of 600 microns or 0.6 millimeters. But really, it's not an accurate reflection that every particle has that size. There's a whole distribution of them. There's particles that are much larger and particles that are very, very small. So some, some things when you're doing this to be aware of, you should almost always have a zero mass retained on that first screen. It's good practice that you put a screen at the top through which all your particles will pass. Okay? Because if you don't have that zero at the beginning, then you're going to get mass landing up on that next screen that really should have been on that prior screen. So you, can't, you might bias your results by having a greater weight over there or greater mass over there than should otherwise be there. So it's good practice to ensure that the screen just prior to it Keep adding screens until your, your first screen gets you a zero. Okay. And the reason why we do that is because when we report these diameters later on, we don't actually report the size of the screen over there. So let me use those. Um, I'm going to use rows 2 and rows 3 as an example. So 1180 one, microns might have been this screen sitting over here, and below it was the next screen with 1,000 microns. Okay. So the particles that get retained on this screen over here, it's not fair to call those particles of diameter 1,000 microns. The opening size on this screen is 1,000 microns. So particles that are 1,000 or smaller will pass through that. So these particles actually are not 1,000 microns. Similarly, the particles that are retained over here on this screen 
are not 1,180 microns. These particles are larger than 1,180. So in fact, the particles on this screen over here, we simply give the average of 1,000 plus 1,180 divide 2 and say that's the particle size of those particles on that screen. You can be a little bit more sophisticated because this is a geometric progression of screens. You saw that over here. Each screen is subsequently followed by the other in a geometric progression. In that equation that was over there. Okay. So another way of characterizing these is to say it's 1,000 times 1180 and take the square root of that. But the two numbers are not very different. Whether you use the average or whether you use the geometric average, you get roughly the same number. So I'll just use the average in this course to characterize those particles. Okay, so we'll take it further from that point next class.